John is our, well, we, we've recently hired Luke to, to help John do geomorphology but for a long time after uh, Vic and Bill Bull uh, departed, John has been our, our major geomorphologist in the department. He joined the department in 1999 he, after finishing his, his uh, PhD at Cornell, where he was, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, John, but I think he was Don Turcott's last PhD student there. Um, he then did a postdoc at Caltech. He, had, he already had an undergrad degree at Caltech. He went back to do a postdoc there for uh, about a year, a year and a half. And then he joined us here uh, in 99 and uh, moved right on schedule through the ranks to become full professor in 2010. Um, along the way, he became a GSA fellow and a Galileo Circle fellow. He's published uh, a book and a, something on the order of 135 papers in journals completely across the spectrum of science. Um, when we looked at, when John applied for the job here, I remember I was on that search committee and I remember us on the committee, we, we were looking at each other, not really knowing quite what this person was because he had uh, something like 12 or 15 papers, all first authored and they ranged from Topics. I'll just sort of go through a, a quick list of the topics that he was touching on in these papers. Atmospheric science, solar luminosity, clouds, molecular dynamics, uh, climate modeling, diffusion models of sedimentation, self-organization, and, and so on. And we thought, wow, this guy looks pretty smart. We, we, <laughs> we should maybe get him in here for an interview. And he came in and he blew us away. Um, as he has continued to do since then. Um, he quickly set himself to the task of, of uh, carrying on the great geomorphological work that had been, gone, had been going on in this department for many years. Um, he's, he's also had a long-term interest in aeolian sedimentation. He continues to work on that. Um, he also did a lot of solid earth stuff, a lot of geodynamic modeling, as you might expect from a, from a Turcotte student. And, um, and he's also done a lot of practical modeling to do with flood prediction, for example. And, uh, and today he'll be talking to us about something that's perhaps along those lines. The title of, of John's talk is Designing Mine Site Reclamations That Minimize Erosion. So uh, thanks, John, for stepping up in this, uh, in this early slot and take it away. All right, thank you, Pete. Um... Thank you for the very gracious uh, and uh, sweet introduction. So thank you all for, for, for zooming in today. I appreciate your time and your interest in this work. Mine site reclamation refers to the act of transforming a formerly mine site into one in which mine waste stays on site and requires little to no maintenance for a long period of time. So this image, the image in this slide is an oblique perspective view of a tailings dam in Arizona. The top of the tailings is susceptible to wind erosion and the embankment on the edge is susceptible to erosion by a combination of gravity and the shear stress associated with runoff. Reclamations have multiple goals, including to minimize the hydrologic interaction of runoff with the waste. The focus of this talk, however, will be on how we can best design reclamations that minimize erosion by gravity and flowing water on steep portions of reclaimed landscapes, such as the embankment in the foreground of this image. There are two dimensions to reclamation, landforming and covering, and this slide deals with the first of those two dimensions. Landforming refers to the process of modifying the topography to minimize erosion. This image illustrates three potential post-reclamation morphologies for the tailings embankment shown in the previous image. The reclamation community generally regards a slope of 0.3 meters over meters, uh, rise over run, or 15 degrees, as likely resistant to erosion if other steps are taken to minimize erosion. So the top image is a planar slope that's based on that value. There's more runoff on the bottom of any slope than there is at the top, so an alternative is to reduce the slope and hence the shear stress associated with runoff 
near the bottom relative to the top. That concave option is illustrated in the middle image. Another alternative is a more complex valley and ridge type of landform that has the advantage that it looks more like a natural landform, and that's the one that's shown at the bottom. There are, of course, an infinite number of possible landforms, and one goal of this work is to establish best practices for uh, determining which landforms are most stable um, for uh, other prescribed conditions, keeping in mind that each unit volume of dirt that you move around costs a certain amount of money. So this slide deals with the cover dimension. And so in the upper right-hand corner, I'm showing uh, a typical rock armor cover that's used in semi-arid landscapes where the vegetation is sufficiently sparse that you need some other type of uh, erosional resistance process or mechanism. Um, and often a four inch median diameter rock armor is placed on the surface. Um, mine waste first is usually covered with two to three feet of local soil and then a layer of rock armor, sometimes mixed with uh, soil as shown at the schematic on the top left and sometimes not um, as shown in the schematic in the bottom left. Um, a key difference between the two cover types shown here in the top and bottom schematics is that a bedding or filter layer of gravel has been placed between the soil and the rock armor on the cover shown on the lower left. Filter layers allow for enhanced drainage and they hence tend to lower pore pressures, but as I will discuss, they have an equally important role to play in controlling internal friction, the angle of internal friction. Now, each layer costs in the neighborhood of a million dollars per square kilometer. So it's possible that the cover that includes the bedding layer might be 50% more expensive than the one that does not. So this means that designers must demonstrate that the greater cost uh, of adding an additional layer is justified by uh, significantly improved, per, improved performance. But hopefully this slide gives you an idea of the kinds of cover materials that are used. And my goal here in this talk is to give you a sense of what, what, is, what is some of the basic physics that allows us to choose one cover material over another? So this image illustrates one of the sites that uh, is part of this study. This tailings embankment was reclaimed in 2007. It's located in the next valley over the San Pedro Valley. Uh, it's approximately 350 meters in length. It's 100 meters in height, roughly and has one foot of four inch median rock diameter placed at the surface as shown in the lower left. Now, despite the presence of that erosionally resistant cover, there are sections of this tailings embankment that experience rill erosion every year. Um, these incipient rills must be regraded by a bulldozer in order to prevent the rills from exposing the waste. Now, this represents a significant and perpetual expense for the mining company. And so the goal is really to avoid this kind of problem in the future. So with many reclamations planned over the next few decades in Arizona and the southwestern United States and around the world and other semi-arid locations, my goal is to understand why the reclamation at this site uh, has not performed as expected so that future reclamations can, can, can avoid those kinds of problems. Um, before I you know, dive into the science a little, in a little bit more detail, I just want to explain you know, what drew me to this problem. It's significantly more applied than things that I've worked on before. So I was attracted to it because planar hill slopes are the most basic of all landforms. They are the Drosophila of geomorphology, if you will. Um, and this project, I thought, was a unique opportunity to gather data on their short time scale evolution at scale. So these, are, these hill slopes are as big as they get, you know, and, and we can monitor them in a way uh, with construction techniques that I'll describe in a way that is uh, fairly unique um, in terms of what's possible using standards, say NSF projects. And I also thought that if geomorphologists such as myself are to claim really any ability to understand how Earth's surface works, we really should be able to predict erosion rates on planar hill slopes such as this one. Now, of course, I'm being provocative by referring to this as a planar hill slope because there's no such thing as a planar hill slope. Um, and that's the that's theme that I'll refer to. So the microtopography of this site is important and, for controlling erosion, and that's a theme that I'll refer to back a couple times in, this, in the talk. So as part of this project, I've gathered annual data on when and where rills form 
at several reclaimed study sites in Arizona. And this is an example image of the kind of data that I'm using to determine that annual series of rill formation. These data are sometimes limited. So this image from 2011 shows the tracks of bulldozer, bulldozers that were used to regrade the incipient rills following the monsoon season of the previous year. So we don't have, you know, we're not to the Defense Department, so we don't have like a daily view of the entire Earth at high resolution. We have data that is spaced out over time, and so sometimes we're not looking at the rills themselves, which in some cases are actually too small to see to be resolved by the imagery, but often we're looking at the maintenance that was performed post-rilling. So these data, what they do is they bracket where rilling takes, takes place, and they do not always provide a precise location of precisely down to the, you know, the individual meter uh, where rills form. So that's a limitation that I've tried to account for in the analysis. So this slide illustrates the full eight kilometer length of a tailings embankment illustrated in the previous two slides. So I've shown you snapshots of this. This is the full, the full thing. So it's eight kilometers long. It's a large study site. And um, I've shown zones where maintenance has occurred in the previous year in red. So these, these example images demonstrate that maintenance following rill erosion is limited to the central most two kilometers of the embankment during, uh, during all years. And uh, during years where there's a weak monsoon season, such as 2013 and 14, shown in the top image, uh, the, the erosion occurs in just a few narrow locations. So there's about six locations, narrow strips in the top image that show where rilling took place in these relatively dry years. Now, conversely, in a strong year like 2016, the monsoon was much more active. What happens is you still have erosion limited to the centralmost two kilometers, but it expands outward and there are more areas and they start to coalesce. So the key point of this slide is that we have an annual sequence of imagery that tells us when, when and where rills take place and that there is a large scale control on where erosion takes place in the sense that it's restricted or localized to the centralmost two kilometers. But depending on the activity of the monsoon season, the intensity of the monsoon season, we, there is a small scale control that causes more, fewer or more areas to be activated. So I wanna to try to understand both the large scale controls that cause erosion to be localized in this central two kilometer region, but I also want us to understand the small scale controls because both are important. So this is a color map of slope steepness expressed as rise over run or the tangent of the angle of the slope if you prefer for the tailings embankment with the steepest areas illustrated as yellow and white. Erosion occurs almost exclusively in the centralmost portion where slopes are in the range of about 24 to 26 degrees. Slopes elsewhere are lower but only modestly so. Slopes in the range of 20 to 23 degrees exist in other places of the embankment where real erosion does not occur during any year. So there appears to be a switch that turns on at about 24 to 25 degrees that leads to significantly more erosion. And there's a, there's a, there's a great deal of stability below that threshold. So I performed a multivariate logistic regression to try to quantify the controlling factors on where er erosion takes place in this tailings embankment. This analysis relates the probability of real erosion P to potential controlling factors, including the slope steepness S, the unit contributing area A, and the vegetation index V, which is derived from airborne LIDAR data. And this type of analysis assumes power law relationships among the variables. Unit contributing area is a topographic index that quantifies the degree of convergence and hence of runoff localization in the landscape. I'll present maps of unit contributing area in the next couple of slides that I think will clarify what that variable represents. This analysis demonstrates that statistically significant relationships, those with very low p-values, exist between the probability of real erosion and both the slope and the unit contributing area. Note that the exponent beta one relating the real erosion to slope is higher than 20, indicating a very nonlinear relationship. Again, there's a switch that turns on at a value of slope of about, of about 25 degrees. Um, there's no statistically significant relationship uh, between the probability of real erosion and vegetation cover, which makes sense considering that rock armor that is four inch 
four inches in diameter tends to be resistant to shear stresses up to on the order of 100 pascals and the sparse vegetation cover of this landscape does not provide a shear strength anything close to that value. Really the rock arm that we're doing the resistance to erosion here. So in this and the next slide, I'd like to interpret the highly nonlinear relationship between real erosion probability and slope in terms of the tendency of the threshold unit discharge or shear stress of a, of a cohesionless granular material such as a rock armor to approach zero as the slope approaches the angle of internal friction. Now, I will use the terms unit discharge and shear stress somewhat interchangeably. Uh, essentially, they have equivalent information for steep slopes such as this. If the fruit number of the flow is close to one, that's called a critical flow, then shear stress and unit discharge can be related by a simple analytic expression and they provide equivalent information. So oftentimes the engineers use unit discharge, which is the amount of, it's basically cubic meters per second of water moving through the rock armor system or on top of the rock armor system uh, divided by you know, a single unit meter. Um, that's unit discharge and shear stress has equivalent information to it. That has units of pascals. And so I'll go back and forth between the the top image conceptually illustrates the case in which flat-lying granular material requires a relatively large unit discharge of water, Q sub W, that is related to the grain diameter, the density of the particles, and the acceleration due to gravity. Um, and that large threshold unit discharge required to initiate motion is represented by the relatively long arrow. The unit discharge or shear stress required to initiate motion decreases towards zero as the angle of internal friction is approached, which for a large angular particle such as rock armor is approximately 45 degrees. And that's the situation shown in the lower left. And there's no slope in this study area that's anywhere close to 45 degrees. However, for layered covered materials, which is the case we have here, the limiting angle of internal friction is not that associated with the internal friction within the rock armor or within the soil, but rather it's between the rock armor and the soil. So there was some nice work done by Miller and Byrne in the 1960s, and they quantified the dependence of the angle internal friction in a layered material on the relative diameters of the particles on either side of the interface between the two layers. And they showed that in some cases, the angles of internal friction at that interface could approach 30 degrees, which is you know, obviously much lower than either of the materials themselves. So I came across that work first when I was studying, trying to understand uh, the wind-driven migration of large rocks on the Martian surface. So on Mars, you have these large rocks that are too big to actually be entrained by the wind, but they still move around. So why do they move around? Well, there's a sandy surface underneath them. And basically, there are spiral holes, and they're basically rolling around in their spiral holes. So you need to know something about how these larger rocks um, move around or don't move around on subtle slopes um, within their scour holes. That was the gist of that paper. Um, so I first came across this and I thought that that was also relevant here. Um, the friction angle at the interface between small and large angular particles is commonly in the neighborhood of about 30 degrees. And you remember that at the tailings embankment, we have slopes that are 24 to 26 degrees where erosion is taking place. So, um, I think this is an important control on the fact that it requires a lot less water to do the same amount of erosion in the central portion of the tailings embankment that I just showed you. So this slide compares the highly nonlinear dependence between the probability of erosion and slope steepness indicated by the multivariate logistic regression that I presented to the inverse of the factor decrease in the unit discharge as the slope approaches the angle of internal friction, which in this case I've taken to be uh, the tangent of that angle is 0 0.58, and I will present a calibration later on that, that supports that value. The graphs are not identical, so basically the, 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 the heavier line represents the s to the 20th power, and the lighter line represents the physical model that we use to determine the decrease in shear stress or Similarly, the unit discharge required to initiate motion. I use this model um, in, 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 a, in a number of different contexts. If you've ever been on a sand dune, you know that on the lee side of a sand dune where the avalanche would take place, you need only oftentimes just the subtlest breath of air can initiate an avalanche. So that's the basic idea that close to the angle of repose or angle of internal friction, 
of these granular materials, you can initiate motion using shear stresses that are much lower than you would on a flat surface. And that's what's going on here. So these two graphs are not identical. I'm not suggesting that they are, but they both increase very abruptly above slopes that are approximately 0 0.4 meters over meters or 20 degrees. And this result, I think, provides a preliminary basis for relating the highly nonlinear slope dependence observed in data to the decrease in the unit, unit, unit discharge expected from basic physics as the slope angle approaches the angle of internal friction. So the presence of an abrupt transition from rock armor to soil can cause the friction angle to be unusually low, as I've mentioned. That's a key point I want to emphasize. This is one reason why filter layers that are made of intermediate sized particles like gravel can be so effective. They can increase the friction angle by 30%, you know, from 30 to 40 degrees, which can have a very large effect on the erosional resistance of slopes in the range of 25 to 30 degrees. So this image shows the correlation spatially between uh, where maintenance has occurred, and that's the top image. There's rilling that's taken place here in 2010, and then the bulldozer has gone back and forth and created some light streaks because they're adding additional dirt. So just trust me in the details, but basically the arrow shows where, uh, where the bulldozers have been in this particular uh, portion of the landscape. And the bottom shows a unit contributing area map. Um, and it's shown as a color map with white and yellow indicating the highest values and blue representing lower values. Contributing area is the upslope area that drains through each pixel in the topographic model. Unit contributing area simply divides that, that number, the total contributing area, by the pixel width. I like thinking in terms of unit contributing area for the purposes of this example because it represents the equivalent length that the slope would be if it were planar. Unit contributing area quantifies the degree to which the runoff becomes localized into subtle depressions in the topography. This embankment is 350 meters in length horizontally, but the unit contributing area approaches 1,000 meters in some places, the areas that are yellow and white in this, in this map. This indicates that due to flow convergence, there is three times the amount of runoff in some places than would be the case if the hill slope were actually planar. So where do these subtle de topographic depressions come from? The zones where flow convergence coincides, um, the, the zones where flow converges coincides with locations where gullies existed prior to the reclamation that were not completely filled in by the land forming process. And this slide demonstrates that, I think. The upper left image is an oblique perspective view that identifies locations where persistent erosion, real erosion occurs. And using this uses an image from 2010, just as an example, to show those locations. The remaining images are color maps of unit contributing area based on the topography at three instances in time. First, um, the uh, panel B in the lower left indicates the topography in the pre-reclamation period, 2003, when deep gullies existed on the embankment. Also in 2007, that's the lower right. This is the immediate post-reclamation period. And again in 2017, which is the upper right. So the correlation coefficient between the maps from 2003 and 2007 in the lower left and lower right respectively is 0 0.6. The image from 2007 right after the rec reclamation shows a lesser degree of flow convergence because the land forming process mostly erased the gullies and left only subtle depressions, some just 50 centimeters below the surrounding topography. The correlation coefficient between the maps from 2003 and 2017 is higher, it's 0 0.8, indicating that the post reclamation erosion has returned flow patterns to much the same configuration associated with the deep gullies that existed in the pre reclamation landscape. So essentially, the reclamation process mostly made these uh, made a planar landscape, but there was just enough topographic depression on long slopes such as this. It doesn't require a lot. All you need is some amount of flow convergence, and you're really not looking at a planar landscape anymore. You're looking at hill slopes whose equivalent lengths can be three, four, five times higher than what you'd expect, just based on very subtle topographic depression. So this result, I think, highlights the importance of microtopography in causing flow convergence, particularly on the long slopes they're often associated with tailings embankments. So these kinds of flow convergence uh, zones really need to be minimized in any future reclamation. So this is a kind of a big hairy one, but um, an important aspect of the quantitative modeling work that I'm trying to do in this project 
is to relate the threshold peak water discharge, either observed or expected if we're talking about the future, to characteristics of the cover material, the rock armor principally. This equation shown here is based on approximately 100 large scale experiments conducted in flumes. And so an example is the, uh, the flume at Colorado State University shown in the lower right. They put rock armors into this thing and they put large discharges of water over the edge and they looked to see how much discharge is required in order to cause failure. Um, so this equation was developed using a multivariate regression similar to the one that I presented earlier. And the equation um, includes median rock particle diameter, as you expect. It's a little harder to pick up larger median rock sizes. The variance in the rock particle diameter is also important, and that's expressed as what we call the coefficient of uniformity, um, the density, of course, of the material, the layer thickness, and also the internal friction angle all play significant roles in, in controlling the threshold water discharge in addition to the slope angle. So this is a key variable that expresses the resistance uh, that I include in my numerical model. I need to know, you know, what threshold discharge, how much rain do I need to put down in the landscape in order to cause failure of the, of the cover given cover material specific parameters. And this is what characterizes that. And this is, comes from Thornton et al. 2014, but I've updated that analysis to include the effects of internal friction, which weren't included in that analysis because they weren't focused on particularly steep slopes. So um, this analysis, excuse me, um, I've integrated the equation in the previous slide into a model that routes peak rainfall rates through a topographic model, a digital elevation model, taking into account infiltration, including the fact that runoff coefficients tend to decrease with increasing contributing area. The result is a numerical model that I call RILGEN 2D. Before introducing the model, I should mention that there are other tools that are widely used for predicting real erosion rates. Um, the revised Universal Soil Loss Equation version 2, or, or Russell 2, and the Water Erosion Prediction Project, or WEP, are commonly used for this purpose. Um, I think both models have strengths, and they have a long history of being used, but there are clear limitations as well, including the fact that neither model explicitly includes data on the two-dimensional shape of the landscape. They're only taking in, into account one-dimensional slope profile data. So if you only have a slope profile, then you have no information on subtle topographic depressions of the kind that I've just shown to be quite important in this particular example. Um, and also, um, neither of those models explicitly includes information about the cover materials, such as the median particle diameter, which is very important. So this slide illustrates the application of this RILGEN 2D model to a heap leach with a central ridge and hill slopes emanating in all directions from the ridge. This landform is located near the tailings embankment that I've shown previously and was also reclaimed in 2007. The upper left image illustrates the study site as a shaded relief image, and the solar angle is coming from the upper left. So hopefully this gives you a sense that we're looking at a ridge-like landscape with hill slopes that are, that are divergent in all directions around it. And this image identifies three locations where significant rilling has taken place in the 13 years since the reclamation was completed. So for example, if you follow my cursor, then in the upper right of this image, you can see some rills that were present when the LIDAR was flown, and they show up uh, pretty well in this particular image, okay? There are three images where rilling takes place. So this is a relatively successful reclamation in that in 13 years, it's just been minor rilling that's taken place, but that rilling is still important. It's showing us where the cover can be undermined um, and uh, by sufficiently large discharges. The image um, in the lower left is analogous to the unit contributing area maps that you've seen previously, but it also includes rainfall and infiltration data to estimate a peak shear stress exerted on the cover by the runoff. And this is associated with the event that was the largest that had the most rainfall during this 13-year post-reclamation period. The model compares the peak shear stress from that event 
So that required to initiate reeling based on the data set of large scale flume experiments that I just showed in the previous slide. The model uses the ratio of peak shear stress to peak shear strength, F. That variable F shows up in the legend in panel C, and that predicts the likelihood of real erosion over the time scale during which the peak rainfall rate has occurred. A value of, a, of F that's above one is associated with reeling, and that's shown uh, as red in the image. And the areas in yellow are not predicted to rill, but they could be susceptible to rilling if you include a factor of safety of two, as is commonly done in engineering calculations. So the, engineer, the infiltration parameters in the model, I won't go into the, that aspect of the model in tremendous detail, but I'll just give you a sense of how we understand how rainfall and runoff are partitioned in these landscapes. The infiltration parameters in the model are based on measurements that Nate Abramson, who works with me and is my collaborator, has made at monitoring plots. And so this shows several of those monitoring plots that we've installed at the study sites. Image on the left side is an oblique perspective view of two of the plots that we monitor for water and sediment discharge during rainfall events. The small plot at this location, the one that is shown here as a rectangle, the small plot is bounded on all sides and it has a detention basin on its downslope edge. The basin detains bed load sediment that is collected and weighed, but also allows water and suspended sediment to spill into a trough and tipping bucket that records discharge and measures sediment turbidity at high temporal resolution. The image at left also includes the outlet of a large plot with a contributing area that's about 10 times that of a small plot. So this is my large plot here. We don't have it completely bounded on all sides because we're taking advantage of natural topographic divides. We're funneling that water into a set of concrete wind walls that feed into a partial flume. So the way that partial flume works is that it has to be level but given a flow stage measured with a pressure transducer, it is calibrated to provide a discharge. And so we've created this, this we've done construction or, or rather our subcontractor, subcontractor has done the construction to provide us with um, the instrumentation that we can use to measure water and sediment discharge at multiple scales. And that scale dependence is really important. So our collaborators at Landlock have performed rainfall simulations, I show that in the upper right, panel C, uh, to quantify the hydrologic and geomorphic response at spatial scales of approximately 10 square meters. So between the rainfall simulation and the monitoring plots, we're able to constrain the hydrologic and geomorphic response of this landscape over three orders of magnitude of contributing area. So let me give you a sense of what those data look like. This plot illustrates the scale dependence. So on the bottom axis, I have contributing area, and on the y-axis, we're plotting peak runoff coefficients. These are defined as the ratio of runoff or, or discharge of water to the product of the rainfall rate and the contributing area. We're plotting that as a function of contributing area. Um, the open circles indicate all the data, while the closed circles are the geometric means for each contributing area, and they average out variations due to antecedent moisture and other transient effects that might be important. So these runoff coefficients have also been normalized by the average slop, slope of the plot upslope, and that's just because the effect of slope on runoff is included in the model. So gently sloping areas have more infiltration, uh, there's more opportunity for infiltration to take place, so there's a slope dependence on the runoff coefficient within the model. So there's a couple of different things here, but you can generally think of this as a runoff coefficient, which is essentially the water yield. What is the ratio of water coming out of the catchment to that going in by rainfall? And we just included a slope factor in this as well. So what's important here is that the data demonstrate that the runoff coefficient per unit slope gradient decreases as a power law function of contributing area, at least over this range of spatial scales, an effect that is critically important to include in order to estimate a peak shear stress. So as you go to larger contributing areas, your runoff coefficient goes from something close to one to something that is much less than 0.1. So if you don't have this decrease in runoff with spatial scale in the model, then uh, you might overestimate shear stresses by an order of magnitude, which is not a good thing. So um, this, these kind of data are hard won. So you know all the monitoring plots that I showed you in the previous uh, image, they, these are costly um, kinds of um, construction activities and instrumentation activities. But in the end, we get, I think, really high quality data that show us the hydrologic response as a function of scale. Now, um, 
the if the runoff coefficient scales as area to the minus 0.39 power as shown here then the runoff itself will scale as area to the 0.61 power this is i think broadly consistent with the results of the the, the geostatistical analysis that, that i presented earlier that showed that the probability of erosion scales with area to the 0.72 power so those numbers are a little bit different but they're still in the same neighborhood so there's a relationship, I think, between these data and the large-scale geostatistical analysis performed on the entire Kellington Bankland. Now, um, the geomorphology world has a gem of a research site located near Tombstone, Arizona, the Walnut Gulch Experimental Watershed, and that's shown in the top image here. This is operated by the Agricultural Research Service, and I work with those folks, and I love them. Um, often when my research provides data on the scale dependence of hill slope or fluvial processes, I try to compare my results to similar data from Walnut Gulch in order to see if there's a robustness there. So this is a plot of the peak runoff coefficient versus contributing area for eight watersheds in Walnut Gulch that have been monitored for decades. My monitoring plots have been only been out there for like less than a couple of years, but these, go these folks at ARS have been doing this for a really long time, so they have really good data sets. Here I'm just showing the uh, geometric mean uh, of the runoff coefficients across lots of different events as a function of contributing area. And here you can see that their data is covering five orders of magnitude in area, mine are only covering three. So, you know, that's not so, you know, but this, the point here is that there's a similar power law dependence between runoff coefficient and drainage area. Their exponent is um, 0.31 minus 0.39. So there's some differences there, but uh, it also shows that the power law behavior is robust. So more work is needed to understand the controls on the exponent of the relationship of runoff coefficient to contributing area. But preliminary work, I'll just describe, I just show this conceptually what my idea is. Preliminary work points to the self-affined nature of spatial variations in, hydrolog in hydraulic conductivity as an essential element in understanding why a power law relationship exists. So a self-affined function, that's kind of a jargony term, but it's one that has a power spectrum that is a power law function of either wave number or frequency if you're talking about time. Basically, they're functions that have stochastic variability that because they follow power laws are fractal or have no characteristic scale. The simplest example of a self-defined function is a random walk. Uh, it has a power spectrum that's proportional to the inverse square of the wave number. And hydraulic conductivity has been shown to be similar statistically to a random walk in terms of its spatial variability. So in this conceptual image, I've just shown uh, a random walk, one realization of a random walk, representing hydrologic conductivity as a function of distance down a slope. So the variability has the effect that on longer slopes or on larger drainage basins, there are larger excursions from mean hydraulic conductivity in which the runoff from upslope can infiltrate before the outlet is reached. So if you think of this, basically uh, there's runoff being produced in the areas that are shown in the image where th that are crosshatched. Uh, but as you go down the slope, there are larger excursions from the mean that can provide places where infiltration occurs. So the yield at the base of a long hill slope can actually be quite small because there are these locations that due to variations in porosity, uh, macro, macro permeability associated with soil fractures and things like that, you can get a lot of infiltration in the subsurface. So um, small hill slope segments that produce measurable runoff tend to have higher runoff coefficients than larger hill slope segments that include portions with high infiltration rates that can absorb the runoff from upslope. So I can show you, I don't, I'm not going to go into this level of detail, but I can show that Runoff production from a landscape with self-defined variability of hydraulic conductivity results in a power law decrease in the runoff coefficient with increasing contributing area that is consistent with data. Now, this is important, I think, because many models, including WEP, assume a proportional relationship between runoff and contributing area. There's no loss of runoff with area, and that's going to result in significant overprediction of runoff, uh, particularly large spatial scale. So the runoff. The, sorry, the real gen model has eight parameters, and I've shown them here, six of which can be readily constrained using data such as the median particle diameter, which is part of the as built uh, for the design, and the thickness of the rock armor. So those things are either observed or they're part of the design itself. The two parameters that are not well constrained are the friction angle and the intercept of the runoff coefficient versus contributing area. I'll call that value B. So this is kind of inside baseball. I don't want to get too much into this, but 
The image on the, on the right is the result of a calibration. So what I've done is I've taken my annual series of data showing where real erosion takes place, and I've just used the early years to keep the later years for validation purposes. And I fit what the model predicts for a wide range of different parameters against what I see in observation. And so this represents sort of a two-dimensional map that I can use to determine the least squares error between model predictions and observations. And what it tells me is that there's a range of B and 10 phi values that give relatively low errors, but the best fit occurs where B is 2.7 and tan phi is 0 0.58. Those are the best fit values to the study sites. So the main point of the slide is that I'm using a tightly calibrated model that is not in any way tuned to the data that I'm trying to compare to the model predictions. And I think that's important. As a modeler, you don't want to be you know, able to tune your model to something to make it look good. You really need to have independent calibration data where every parameter is tightly calibrated to data that has nothing to do with the data that involves validation. So let me just show you the validation. I won't, I'll just show it to you in a kind of a qualitative way. Uh, this slide illustrates the prediction, or I should say probably the retrodiction of the model, because we're talking about the past, of real erosion in 2015. So I'm using a particular year that has a particular rainfall pattern that's, that exists in historic data. And I think the model closely reproduces observed patterns. So the upper image, you can see some rilling in that image, maybe a little hard at this uh, resolution, but the areas that are in white indicate where rilling has taken place. And so these are based on, on maps of, of, of rill generation. And so the image in the middle shows that white, yellow, red output from the rill gen model. Red is sort of guaranteed to be rill, susceptible to rilling. Yellow is in the neighborhood of being susceptible to rilling, and white is not susceptible to rilling. So what we're seeing here is that there are areas along this steep middle section. So if you look at the total embankment image, uh, most of the erosion is taking place right here in the middle. There's very little that takes place outside the centralmost two kilometers. And then within that centralmost two kilometers, we're looking at rilling where the unit contributing area or the flow is being localized into those topographic depressions. And they coincide pretty well with where rilling actually takes place. So in the last few slides, I'd like you to show you how this model can be used to assess the likelihood of erosional resistance in future reclamation designs, so alternative proposed designs. And so let's start with climate first. The peak rainfall rate in the model can be constrained for every location in the United States using the NOAA precipitation atlas. Obviously, we're talking about climate changes as well, so this is not going to be perfect. But this graph shows the results for San Manuel, Arizona. It plots the, um, the five minute duration rainfall rate, peak rainfall rate versus the recurrence interval. So if you're, if you're, base, so if you're looking at a recurrence interval of 100 years, this suggests that over a period of 100 years, we should expect to see uh, rainfall intensities that are about 220 millimeters per hour over a five minute duration at this location in Arizona. Now we also have uh, climate change taking place. And so the climate models that I've looked at don't necessarily do really intense precipitation well, but they suggest that um, the five minute duration rainfall intensities will be about 10% more intense by 2100 relative to today. And I'm sure that, you know, that that's, uh, that's not really well constrained, but all I've done is just to crank this, uh, this graph up, sort of modern climate graph up by about 10%, suggesting that uh, at San Manuel, Arizona, we should be looking at um, possible five minute duration rainfall intensities of 250 millimeters per hour over a hundred year time scale. If anyone has any improvement on that, please let me know. This slide illustrates an analysis of the geostatistical properties of the microtopography of the tailings embankment site. So the color image on top shows the topography with the long wavelength variations removed. The power spectrum of this micro topography has a power law dependence on wave number with an exponent of minus two at scales less than approximately 100 meters, indicating that the micro topography at this site is approximately self affine. Um, more precisely, it's similar to the transects are similar to a Brownian walk. 
So I wanted to characterize the microtopography because it's important to include that microtopography in synthetic landscapes that we then input to the model. So it's important to include the microtopography in any topographic model, including these synthetic examples here. These are planar landscapes that have superimposed on them microtopography that is statistically identical to the microtopography that I just showed. So uh, these results are for a 400 meter long slope with a gradient of 0 0.3 or 15 degrees, so a modest slope, in a San Manuel-like climate with cover characteristics that are equivalent to those of the tailings embankment. The results at left are for microtopography of the tailings embankment itself, and the ones at right are for a hypothetical case in which improved construction techniques were employed to reduce the microtopographic amplitude by a factor of three. The results predict that rills are likely to form during a 100-year occurrence interval event, approximately three-quarters of the way down the slope on the left. No rilling is predicted to occur on the slope on the right over the same time scale, century time scale. So this, I think, demonstrates that microtopography is extremely important. It essentially controls um, you know, uh, the steering of the flow, which on a long slope can give rise to either quasi-periodic zones of flow convergence, as is partially the case in the tailings embankment, because we see those gullies were periodic prior to closure. Um, and this is, uh, there's no periodicity in this particular example, because it's based on a random field, but there's still steering of topography, steering of flow that can lead to zones of convergence. And so another way to think about that is to plot the probability or frequency distribution of shear stress. And so this, this just throws, shows three different amplitudes of microtopography. Essentially what you do when you increase the microtopography is you increase uh, the variance of shear stress. So uh, more rugged microtopography leads to greater variance in shear stress and hence makes drilling more likely to occur, all else being equal. Um, microtopography also plays an important role in setting the periodicity of hill, rills on hill slopes. So if you go back to this slide here, you can see that I think in the lower left example, those yellow zones have a certain pseudo periodicity to them. And this is a little surprising given that the microtopography is entirely random. So there's something about imposing flow connectivity on a landscape that introduces a quasi periodicity that I think is important for our understanding of the spacing of rills on hill slopes, which currently we have essentially no understanding of. So I'd like to return to the question of the pros and cons of different kinds of embankment landforms by considering three synthetic landscapes with varying degrees of valley and ridge amplitude. So here I'm just thinking about what are the benefits or cons, the pros and cons associated with introducing a valley and ridge type landscape to our, uh, to our proposed reclamation landforming design. Um, so I've got three different examples here. It's obviously planar with some microtopography on top, and then we get progressively more valley and ridge type topography as we go down. So the peak shear stress maps predicted by the model indicate that shear stresses are reduced in portions of the landscape that are not in or close to the valley bottom. So as you go from top to bottom, essentially the portions of the landscape that aren't right next to the valley bottom have lower shear stresses. So the introduction of relief in this landscape in the form of valleys and ridges has increased the variance of the shear stress. It's put a lot of shear stress in the valleys, but those are places that we can use concrete to reinforce. So what we've done is we've made the places where the shear stress is high predictable in a sense, and we can manage that increased risk. So the concrete work in a landscape like this costs about $50 per square foot. Um, so the enhanced stability associated with um, portions of this landscape does come at a price. You do have to do some additional construction to get an image like the lower one. But the lower one basically has fewer areas that are close to the threshold of rilling if you block out or stabilize or reinforce the zone where you know that the shear stresses are high. And I've just shown that as black triangles. So I think that um, there's a clear benefit to localizing the risk of rilling to a smaller area within the landscape where that risk can be managed. And that's the point of this slide. So um, just a few um, concluding remarks in future directions. 
In the talk, I've tried to um, share some observations regarding how topographic and cover characteristics influence the erosional resistance of reclaimed landforms. I've demonstrated how reclamations that do not adequately design with internal friction and microtopography in mind can lead to problematic results. I've developed a predictive model that I call RealGen that uses information that is often readily available in order to predict where and, wh and, and when rills will occur in both existing landforms and also alternative proposed reclamation landforms. So um, clearly, you know, I, I want this approach to be used. My hope is that RealGen 2D and future models that are similar to it, that build on it, will be part of the most semi-arid mine site reclamation designs. Um, I can point to exactly zero instances in which this technique has been used uh, in an actual reclamation. So hopefully in five or 10 years, there will be some positive uh, tests of, of this actually working. And so I'm trying to, at this point, uh, collaborate with as many people as possible in the mining community uh, who want to use this, this, this type of uh, real gen 2D specifically and the ideas behind it more, more generally. Um, in terms of things that I'd like to understand better, there's lots of things and I pointed to a few of them. I'd like to better understand how the cover characteristics translates into key physical parameters. Some of this will involve experimentation that I cannot do uh, you know, at the U of A. For example, you know, there's all kinds of different layering associated with cover materials and I don't necessarily know how all those variations translate into an internal friction angle. I can go back to Miller and Byrne from 1966, but that's limited information for sure. Uh, so I'd like to better understand how cover characteristics uh, translate. And one example is in Australia, most of the cover materials, the rock armor that's placed is mixed with soil. And they consider that to be a better approach. In the United States, often things are layered such that the rock armor is not mixed with soil at the surface. Uh, is that better or worse? I have a feeling that it might be worse, but I don't know for sure the basic physics behind whether mixing the rock armor with soil or not is better. And of course, um, hydrologic calculations could provide some input into that. I should also say that I presented results in a very deterministic way. I said, you know, we know these parameters, or we can constrain them really well, and so here are the results and they're unique. But that's not really true, right? So we always have some parameter uncertainty. And so I think a Monte Carlo approach in which parameters like that power law decrease in runoff coefficient with contributing area, I say it's 0.61, but it's not exactly that value. There's uncertainty associated with it. So what I really need to do is run these kinds of models in a Monte Carlo approach that samples the various parameter values from distributions that come from data. And that's really a more robust approach to parameter uncertainty, and that will be part of the future work. So um, I'm developing this model, RealGen 2D. It's important to me to share this with the broader community. So right now I'm working on making a, you know, a, a user, uh, a user-friendly front end to this thing, and it'll be shared um, in in uh, in short order. So thank you very much for listening, and I appreciate uh, your time. Thanks, John. That, that was great. What we need is some crowd noise. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how that'll work. I'll have to get a recording of a, of a crowd. Um, I, let's see. Uh, I'll work on that, Pete. I'll get a, <laughs> yeah, okay. an applause button. Yeah. So I think we, we have time for a few questions, if, if there are any out there. I'm not sure how we're going to, uh, I think maybe Kyle, I'm gonna turn this over to you. You know sure. how to do this stuff. Yeah, I can, I can uh, handle that. So uh, either uh, uh, raise your hands if you have questions and I'll uh, uh, unmute you or on the flip side, you're welcome to type your questions into the chat. I have a question. Yeah, Pete, go for it. Actually, it's two questions. One, uh, one is, are there other people working on this sort of thing at this this high level of um, sophistication, or is, is the industry generally employing a sort of uh, trial and error 
kind of approach to things. And then the second question is, you mentioned at the very end that you want to make this available to the public. That's great. Um, I guess I'm a little surprised that that the people you're working with are willing to let that go. So maybe you could say something about that too. Yeah. Um, so there are really smart people who are working on reclamation for sure. Um, I will say that um, you know, in some cases, uh, the, there, there's real desire um, for mining companies to work with tried and true techniques and tried and true models. And so the models, uh, WEP, for example, um, is, is, it's, was developed in the 1980s by the Agricultural Research, Research Service, uh, by folks that are my friends down at Walnut Gulch. Um, and uh, it's been used for a long time, so there's a real track record there. Uh, but there are limitations uh, that, I, that I alluded to. Um, so there's going to be some spin up time for sure, where you know, the, the onus is gonna be on me to prove that this model is uh, you know, consistent in some cases with WEP, but also has additional capability, such as the inclusion of microtopography, which is, you know, or, or really any two dimensional topography um, so I need to show examples like this one where it's really a, it's really a crucial difference. Um, so I should mention that, that Nate and I are both working on a model intercomparison project that's much, much larger than RealGen. So RealGen is complemented by uh, Russell, or Russell uh, too, WEP, and also Siberia is another model that we're working with. And so we want to basically show the pros and cons of all those models. And I do think that RealGen will find an important niche uh, within the, those range of models. But in some cases, RealGen can provide output that makes other models better. So it's not necessarily the case that RealGen is the end all be all, but it might be an important part of a workflow that includes other kinds of models. So I, I, the short answer is that uh, there's a, there, there are folks in Australia, uh, particularly Gary Wilgoose and Greg Hancock, who are working at a pretty high level to use the Siberia model, which is a two-dimensional flow routing model that's somewhat similar to this. Um, there are technical differences between the models that I think are important and that might have uh, real gen be, you know, lead to better results in some ways. But um, the short answer is that there are a few groups out there, and um, I think the model intercomparison will demonstrate really where the, the niche of this particular model. So I hope I, I should not have presented uh, real gen is, you know, it's sort of my baby, of course, and so I'm going to be a little bit more uh, interested in presenting it, but there are other models out there, Siberia being one, um, that has been used in this kind of reclamation before in a successful way. So uh, I wouldn't have developed real gen unless I thought that there were limitations with other models, but um, it's not absolutely unique uh, in, in the community. And then the second idea would be, um, you know, so you, you asked about, you know, uh, whether it's appropriate to share it. Um, I mean, this is U of A intellectual property. And so um, I think that, um, you know, there is a potential to, um, to, uh, to license it in some way. Uh, but I'm also, as an academic, you know, I like to share my work. And so, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, think carefully about how that's done. But um, I'd like to certainly share the model with anybody that I collaborate with. And, uh, you know, I, I do need to make a, an informed decision about how broadly the model is shared uh, in the next six months or a year. But I, I see the model really as taking fairly simple ideas and combining them in, import, in sort of a, a novel way. But I think that the pieces that go into this model are not particularly deep or interesting, I would say that. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, so whether it's worth, um, uh, you know, not fully sharing it in some way and, and insisting that folks who want to use it collaborate with me. I need to think a little bit more about that. And that's a, that's a, a good point to make. But of course, I want to share as much as possible because that's our tradition in academia. Okay, John, Luke has a question. And then there's a question in the chat from Barbara. But Luke, you can go ahead. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, John, for, uh, for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if you could give us... Um, a bit of a, an idea um, conceptually about how erosion tends to take place on these types of engineered hill, hill slopes. Um, is there, 
you know, usually a progressive stripping of the coarser armor over time, or is it usually a pretty instantaneous failure of um, that entire column of um, armor? Yeah, so we, um, so that's a good question. So I've talked, you know, I talked enough about the angle of internal friction that I may have given the impression that this is rock, this rock armor is just sliding off of these surfaces, but that's not the case. So it really is still run by, it's still being driven by localized runoff in real generation. So one of the rills is shown in the lower right. So this rill is about 20 centimeters across and it's just cutting down pretty rapidly into that uh, cover soil, what we call the Gila conglomerate. So in areas near the rill, the uh, rock armor has been stripped away and it's cut down into it. So there's a zone of like larger scale flow convergence over a couple meters. And then once it starts getting to that somewhat cohesive Gila, it starts to, to, to down cut pretty significantly. So these rills begin um, at various points of the slope, but typically about two thirds of the way down. And then they propagate both up and down slope because they lead to enhanced flow convergence and in the absence of any sort of bulldozer coming in the next year, these things would get very deep and they would uh, turn into gullies. But um, the company cannot let that happen because they cannot release waste uh, from the site. So that's the reason why they're there and that's the reason why they have operations doing this kind of healing process every year. So I think the, so the steep slopes, the slopes that are close to the angle of friction, they do not mean that avalanching is occurring, but they do mean that the shear stress by flowing water that generates small localized rills is that much lower because you're close to the angle of friction. So th these rills are very similar to the kinds of rills you see on you know, highway overpasses all around Arizona. They have the same kind of shape to them. They have an equivalent type of spacing and uh, depth and, and width. Um, but I think they can be initiated on these steeper slopes at lower discharges because of that uh, that effect associated with uh, with cohesionless granular, granular materials, which is what this rock armor basically is. Does that answer your question? Yeah, got it. Thanks. So Barbara has a question in the chat that says, uh, "What are the implications of your results on natural landscapes?" Yeah, that's a good that's a good question. Thanks for that for that, Barbara. Um, you know, um, th there's there's not. Well, so there, there's a couple of good points there. I do want to take this real gen 2D model and try to better understand drainage density using this model. So one of the one of the motivations for doing that is that when folks go to areas and they want to do um, reclamations like this, they will often look at the surrounding natural terrain and they will they'll basically extract a topographic profile usually a one-dimensional topographic profile, down a slope. The slope might be highly divergent, and they will then take that topographic profile and say, okay, there's no channelization on this natural slope, so therefore, this is, an, an, you know, this is giving us confidence that if we build an engineered slope that has a similar slope profile, we can expect that it will be um, resistant to erosion. One problem with that is that a planar hill slope and a divergent hill slope, as I've shown in some of the synthetic modeling I've done, they're completely different in terms of the distribution of shear stress. You know, flow divergence and convergence, essentially that plan form curvature is extremely important in determining, you know, kind of uh, peak shear stresses you should expect. So um, I, what I wanna do is, is give the mining companies a way of looking at natural analogs in the surrounding terrain in a two-dimensional way uh, in order to identify what the thresholds for erosion are. Um, and so I essentially want to take the natural slope analog approach and make it two-dimensional and provide it with, provide mining companies with essentially another way of looking at the landscape by saying these natural landforms in the environment, the same kind of climate, um, either perform or don't perform. What are the, what are the slope lengths essentially that you need uh, and what are the shear stresses associated with those that give rise to the transition from hill slopes to channels? And of course, the hill slope to tra channel transition is drainage density. It's what defines drainage density. So when we look at drainage density, which is just defined as you know how how dense are channels in some unit area, 
Um, drainage density tends to be relatively low where infiltration rates are high, where um, there's a lot of vegetation on the slope that can drive bioturbation. There's a lot of different things, but one of the things that influences drainage density is what is the contributing area needed to actually entrain the material that's in the near surface environment. If, if you're in a rocky environment, that those, those rock fragments near the surface, they tend to increase the threshold shear stress and hence increase the contributing area required to do channelization. So I think there's a relationship between real gen 2D and some of the ideas in real gen 2D and a better understanding of the controls on drainage density in natural landscapes. This is a fundamental um, metric of landscapes all around the world. So my first target is really gonna be a better understanding of drainage density and its relationship to both climate including things like peak rainfall rates and also cover characteristics or rock armor characteristics. Now in natural landscapes, you don't have like this, this anthropogenic you know, cover over the landscape, but you do have rock fragments at the surface, you do have vegetation at the surface, and the shear strengths associated with both of those can be quantified in a way that's similar to what I've done here within RealGen. So drain intensity is really the next, uh, the next target. Thanks, Barbara. So we have another question in the chat. Um, does RealGen 2D have any immediate applications in recently burned landscapes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm, so I actually got some data from Luke McGuire and I'm gonna, uh, as soon as I get a moment of <laughs> free time, I'm actually gonna compare it. So, so Luke, one of the things he does is he goes in you know, before and after the first storm after a fire and he looks at essentially the rills that develop in those hydrophobic landscapes. And so I do think that RealGen 2D is going to be able to reproduce where rilling occurs in those kinds of landscapes. The infiltration parameters will be obviously very different. They'll be site specific. So the B and C values that calibrate or that, that define the relationship between uh, runoff and rainfall and also including the spatial, spatial scale dependence will be quite different in those landscapes. So if you think of a landscape that's highly hydrophobic, the runoff coefficient will be very large and it will be almost independent of area. So like if you were to put water down on asphalt, the runoff coefficient is one everywhere. It has no dependence on area, right? So I think these uh, burned landscapes will have hydrologic coefficients in real gen 2D. They'll be quite different from this landscape. And I may or may not be able to calibrate those values well without the kind of data that I have here, but I'd like to explore that. And I think it's possible to do the one challenge being that the hydrology is so different.